With business running deep in their blood, two ambitious entrepreneurs from England created a footwear brand that became the most successful in the world. For a time, sport, fitness, and television were all dominated by one shoe brand, an underdog that flew too close to the sun and eventually paid the price. This is the story of the dramatic rise and fall of Reebok. Chapter 1 – Breaking the Family Joseph William Foster was born in 1935, and from his birth, his parents expected big things. His grandfather, from where he got his name, had founded an athletic shoe company that he ran with his children. J.W. Foster and Sons had a long history with the athletic community, having developed some of the running shoes in the early 20th century. The running pumps, or spikes on the bottom of the shoe, were revolutionary at the time, and gave athletes much more grip on grass and track. Landmark achievements included Derek Ibbotson breaking the mile world record in J.W. Foster shoes, and providing English Premier League teams with footwear. This company was going to be the foundation of Joseph's business, but he had radically different ideas from his ancestors. At the age of 27, he joined the family business, but he was quickly called up to national service to serve in the military. When he came back, he and his brother Jeff were less than optimistic about the direction of J.W. Foster & Sons. On the rise were brands like Puma and Adidas. Joseph and Jeff didn't believe enough was being done to beat the competition, but their elders didn't listen. Their father and uncle were running the business together and refused to change a thing. And so, in 1958, together, they founded Mercury Sports Footwear believing they could create a better company themselves. But when they found that a company was already registered under that name, they were forced to come up with a new one. After winning a running race as a child, Joseph Foster won a shiny new Webster's Dictionary, and this was how he and his brother would find their new company's name. Flicking through the pages for anything that sounded sporty, fast, or appealing, Joe found his way to the R section. A type of African antelope had the unusual name of Rabak and they liked the ring to it, and thus continuing their family's tradition, but on their own, Reebok was born. Instead of the Afrikaans spelling, they chose to use the American version. Their ultimate goal was to enter the American market, but after 10 years and a failed visit to the States, Reebok was having trouble expanding. Being based across the Atlantic in the United Kingdom stymied any chances they had of finding a distributor. Fireman was given exclusive rights to sell Reebok in the country under the new company Reebok USA Limited. The first Reebok shoe on the market in America was priced at $60, or $250 today. Their release coincided with a fitness boom in the country, with televised workouts, aerobics routines, and recreational sports more available than ever. The women's fitness community was a huge market bursting out of California and celebrity and fitness pioneer Jane Fonda's popular aerobics classes caught on. It helped inspire the development of the Reebok Freestyle, which would be the company's first big hit. Paul Fireman was apprehensive about the idea at first, but after a prototype of a Reebok Freestyle was mocked up, he was convinced. It was a model totally unlike any of its competitors at the time. While Nike and Adidas were making bulky, ostentatious footwear, Reebok had made a thin, understated, clean shoe that resembled a ballet slipper. A massive order of 32,000 units was made, and after a quiet first week, firemen started to become nervous. But after offering a promotional seminar with celebrity Richard Simmons, the shoes flew out of the store. Soon, the Reebok Freestyle was all that any aerobic enthusiast was wearing. At the 1985 Emmy Awards, actress Sybil Shepard wore a pair of orange Reeboks matched with her dress, proving just how far the brand had come. Chapter 3 – Toppling the King Not long after the success of the Reebok Freestyle, firemen bought the rights to the English company as well, bringing the headquarters to Massachusetts, renaming it Reebok International Limited and listing it on the New York Stock Exchange. It may have seemed like a risk, but looking at the numbers, the purchase was a no-brainer. Two years after Reebok's U.S. license had been secured, sales in the country had reached $1.5 million, or $4.4 million today. And this was only the beginning. That figure skyrocketed almost 
10 times over the next year alone. It was clear that the United States was the right market and that Fireman had made the right choice. Now with total control of the company, Fireman shifted his attention from the women's aerobic market to the men's market, with models like the Newport Classic, the Revenge Plus, and the Workout. These were trendy country club ready sneakers, making them perfect to wear both while exercising and socializing. At the time, the market was crowded with big names like Adidas, Puma, Asics, and Nike. First, Reebok needed a new logo. The original British logo featured the Union Jacks. A redesign made the logo into a vector, creating a more abstract collection of lines. In 1988, Reebok was the king of footwear, posting a whopping $1.8 billion in sales, which would be $4.6 billion today. This number, for the first time, was higher than Nike. In fact, it was more than 25% higher than Nike's sales that year, claiming 25% of the entire athletic footwear market too. Reebok had taken Nike by surprise, emerging virtually out of nowhere and using the women's aerobic demographic to springboard itself into the mainstream. Unfortunately, Reebok didn't get much time to enjoy the fruits of their labor and they weren't entirely prepared for what would come back at them. Chapter 4 – Pumping Up Seeing the success of Reebok's increasingly fashionable fitness product, Nike went into overdrive, signing Michael Jordan and releasing the Air Jordan series, followed by the wildly popular Air Max series. It was success after success for a brand that was quickly becoming embedded into the fabric of sport and culture. In a constant battle to remain relevant, Reebok too attached itself to the sporting world. It sponsored tennis players Boris Becker and John McEnroe, making the brand a household name by the end of the 1980s, when the Reebok pump took the company to a new level. In the same year that the pump was released, Joe Foster, the co-founder of Reebok, decided to retire from his post in 1989. His final act had been the development of the Reebok pump, perhaps sensing that was the peak of the company's success. After Joe's departure, the company shifted its focus toward the technology inside its products, and the pump was just that. It used inflatable chambers at the top of the shoe to give customers a customized fit. Iconically, NBA player D. Brown inflated his pumps moments before winning the 1991 NBA Slam Dunk Contest. Unsurprisingly, the Reebok pumps exploded onto the basketball scene, worn by many NBA players including Shaquille O'Neal and Allen Iverson. Reebok also branched out to find new ambassadors, including rappers Jay-Z and 50 Cent. Despite the highs, Reebok would never again match the mania during the growth of the 1980s. Their growth in sales plateaued. Throughout the 1990s, Reebok fought to keep up with Nike by releasing a Shaquille O'Neal special edition model and unveiling their newest shock absorption technology called DMX. But coming into the year 2000, Nike sales were triple those of Reebok's. Having fallen out of the trendy casual sneaker spotlight, Reebok chose to return to its roots. It wasn't quite the spike running shoes of the English athletic days, signing big names like footballer Thierry Henry. These kinds of sponsorships failed to raise the brand value anywhere close to what it had been in the previous decades. Without Joe Foster, the brand was a rudderless ship, and even worse, it was sinking. Chapter 5 The Era of Adidas By 2005, a German athletic company was eyeing up Reebok looking to use it to mount an attack on Nike, which was still dominating the global market. That company was Adidas, which started over 80 years earlier with similar routes to Reebok. Adidas began making spiked running shoes and their first model showcased at the 1936 Summer Olympics by Jesse Owens. The company had recovered from a tumultuous decade through the 1990s and was finding success again in the early 2000s, emerging as the only true alternative to Nike dominance. A key part of that strategy was to make Reebok a subsidiary of its international portfolio for around $3.8 billion, or $5.94 billion today. But Adidas took it in completely the wrong direction choosing to focus on pseudo-innovative technology like ZigTech and partnering with CrossFit rather than following Nike's path of more casual footwear. In many ways, this move made sense for Reebok, a company that had found its initial success in with the surge of popularity in aerobics. 
CrossFit was a natural successor to the 80s fitness craze. Looking to imitate what Under Armour did in the sports industry with long-term contracts, Reebok agreed to a 10-year partnership with CrossFit. Reebok catered to the niche, advertising how it had gathered data from CrossFit participants to create targeted products, and how CrossFit athletes had different demands from runners or different sports people. Reebok was signaling that it was surrendering the retail battle with Nike and trying to specialize its demographic, like Lululemon or Sweaty Betty. Reebok used a wave of new celebrity ambassadors in the years earlier when it released products like the CrossFit Nano 7, and initially, it worked. There was a 6% sales bump to go along with it, but CrossFit failed to make the same cultural imprint that the celebrity aerobics videos and TV workouts did in the 1980s. Chapter 7. Fighting for Survival Just as doomed was Reebok's six-year contract with the UFC, worth over $70 million in 2014, which would be closer to $90 million today. The sportswear company swooped in at a time of immense popularity in mixed martial arts, but was quickly criticized for removing all individual sponsorship, lowering fighter pay, and being used as a bargaining chip to sell the franchise. Unlike in most other combat sports, the Reebok deal with the UFC meant that fighters had to wear a uniform, and their payment was modified to become a tiered system drawn directly from Reebok, not helping the company's image was the disastrous rollout, which saw several fighters' names misspelled and clothing branded generic. Fighters would on occasion speak out against the deal but admitted that consequences behind the scenes for doing so were severe. Like CrossFit, this was another major misstep for Reebok. For five decades, Reebok has tried and failed to sponsor sports leagues, including with Major League Baseball and the NBA. Unlike Nike, Reebok hasn't seen brand value increase from its partnerships, and its products have failed to have a presence. A different strategy of Reebok saw much more success. A brief revival in 2015 of Reebok's relevance was driven by Reebok re-releasing and re-imaging some of its classic collections. Models included the Instapump, the Club Classic 85, and workout models. This was well received by sneaker collectors and older demographics. But cashing in on nostalgia and the rapid success of the 1980s was all Reebok could do by now, and this was a strategy that was always doomed to collapse. Chapter 6 Cutting Losses Recently, Reebok saw a huge demand drop from 1.7 billion euros in 2021 to 353 million in 2022. This was partly due to the pandemic and global supply shortages, but Nike still saw its income grow in the same time frame. In the same year, Adidas was finally ready to admit its mistake. It finally sold Reebok to Authentic Brands Group for $2.5 billion, less than half of what it bought it for when adjusted for inflation. Still, Joe Foster maintains that there is still nothing wrong with Reebok now but that the last 17 years have seen it dominated by a much bigger playing partner in Adidas. If it is given freedom again, then he believes things could turn around. Joe, together with his brother, helped build a company into a global phenomenon, but after he left the company in 1989, Reebok was without leadership or direction. Resources poured into fighting with Nike could have been better used elsewhere to re-establish the brand identity rather than experimenting in too many areas at once, and failed partnerships with CrossFit and the UFC ensured that instead of slowly fading into irrelevancy, Reebok crashed and burned.